So <coughs> we have um, 25 minutes uh, to discuss. relationship between the way you're testing, you know, the, the how, how these kind of digital or virtual objects can contribute to, you know, some real sense of object relation. And I'm wondering whether you've thought about the influence of, you know, sort of virtual spaces and everybody's sort of routine aesthetic lives. Like the closest I've come to 3D models of archaeological objects would be something like Tomb Raider, which on the one hand, absurd, mm -hmm. but on the other, you know, it, it is part of this culture of, of sort of scrounging for digital objects or of kind of digital exploration of 3D spaces that has its own kind of like, you know, virtual but weirdly haptic inputs. You know, and when you're talking about the gestures, I was thinking of all those commercials of idiots with their Wii remotes, <laughs> like hurling them at the screen or something like that. So I, I, I'm just wondering, like, where where this where the sociology of of you know maybe video games narrowly, but just sort of digital virtual space generally kind of do you think it allows for this kind of work, or do you think it creates some sort of Oh, feedback. No, no, definitely. Like we are working on some video games, edu what we call edutainment. edutainment. Uh, so we are really into video games now, not me directly, but uh, in archaeology, there's a new field of studies where people uh, reconstruct archaeological sites and uh, uh, or recontextualize objects in a reconstructed uh, environment and they then uh, insert avatars uh, and people can go online, either online or offline, choose an avatar and just navigate. And of course, space helps a lot um, to understand the materiality of object or simulate this idea of uh, material engagement with uh, with objects. So this is essential. Well, the reason why I, did, I decided not to do this is because um, I prefer to start from uh, the experience that people have with objects inside, inside a museum. So I prefer to really start from the beginning when mm, like we visit a museum and we just see these artifacts showcased in a display. And sometimes with the, these labels that don't mean anything. So I really wanted to understand uh, if uh, we have like an intuition that is that goes be beyond context or uh, space or special information. You know, if uh, just uh, uh, interacting with an object we can get a sense of uh, its uh, function at least I don't want to say meaning because sometimes it's sim symbolic like for example I showed you some uh, so I selected um, an, like some objects uh, in a clever way because for example uh, I chose a pot that was utilitarian it was just used for storing liquids but it had crosses on it. And so people, since they saw a cross, they immediately, immediately attached a ritualistic symbolic meaning to this object that was just utilitarian. And then I gave them a very um, weird uh, Buddhist ritual object and uh, that doesn't have any special uh, iconography attached to it. And so people thought that that was a scoop. <laughs> and so everybody told me, oh, this is a scoop. You see, you, you can really imagine this as a scoop because you would do this and then pour water in this pot, you know? So they even imagined the context through association between the objects I gave to them. So I really wanted to start from the object and that's it. And then, of course, I will add context. That will be my next step for my hopefully postdoc <laughs> if somebody <laughs> gives me the chance to continue so yeah definitely i i really uh like what you asked me thanks i have a question for probably uh, uh first a simple question and what was the, i'd like to know the source of your last slide but the more substantive mm -hmm. question has to do with um the role of printing house practice in uh, the construction of the choices of typography, this mm -hmm. the construction, not in the case of Herbert, that's something special, but uh, 
What, is, what does printing house practice do to your method uh, and your project? Uh, I'll start with the easier one. Um, the last slide is from uh, Johann Comenius's okay, Orbis Pictus. Okay. Um, and the printing house practices is not something that, I mean, it's, a, it's a, another uh, intellectual history that I have not explored, but should. And one of the reasons why I like Ben Johnson is because he's, so, uh, he's documented as being so involved in the putting together of his 1616 folio. So what we saw there is his, uh, the first publication of the mask, but even in the folio edition, it retains all that marginal um, kind of busyness that distracts from the text. So at least with him, I can talk about not so much printing house practice, but at least the, the editorial decisions uh, that he made. Do we have his autographs to see we do, manuscript for, to print? We have for some of them, not so much for something like that, but for his court productions, there are a couple of cases where he had a presentation copy for the Queen or for Prince Charles, Prince Henry. And, I mean, again, with Johnson, he's taken as being so anti-visual that when you see his autograph, he shows a, a level of regard for the aesthetic um, kind of representation of language. So it's so neat. And, and he'll break up words in the middle of words. So I, mean, I think that's emblematic of uh, a counter narrative of Johnson, um, where the visual trumps kind of the, the verbal. But there's kind of a paradox there because you have this dramatization of the book itself. And at the same time, there are images and representations. Um, the book still is such a, a strange material object mm -hmm. that it's constantly being presented uh, so that you're not having the, you know, the immediate vision, but you're looking at, you know, these are, are words printed on a page. This has, you know, a status as a book, which is something strange. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting moment. I mean, if, if I'm understanding it, like, or if, because the, because it's the book, the book becomes the object, right? And that the words are legible words. Um, in some sense, I would think the book, because it's sensible, because it is a physical object, that fits into my larger concern with not just visual representation, but sensible forms of uh, representation. Just to pick up on that, you know, I mean, I, I mean, anyone who spent any time in early 17th century books, they're filled with marginalia, mm -hmm. all of them. So, is there? Uh, something particular about this relationship between science and art, do you think? Or is, is this a particular version of it? I mean, that's, I'm just trying to... Um, I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking about the Geneva Bible, mm -hmm. you know, which if there's a kind of or text for 17th century England, it's the Geneva Bible, right? You know, it's like, it's, this is just kind of, it's all over the place. So... <clears throat> I mean, there's a. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I, so I, I, th I guess the question is really, what's special about these graphical things, or is this just a case study of a larger pattern of graphical typography and and dialogic writing where the the text and the margin are always in conversation. I, I think. Uh, this has a longer history, mm -hmm. um, and part of the my wanting to wrestle with the visual, the visual and the verbal in terms of the graphic has to do with um, Northern Europe in the aftermath of the Reformation and wrestling with those two things too. Um, I th I think what what becomes a con what makes science and literature convenient um, lens for exploring these questions is because someone like Bacon articulates most strongly the anxieties about language. But his peers, people like Ben Johnson um, and, and Herbert, uh, are also voicing concerns about language. So yes and no. I mean, these are the way that books, I mean, the way printing or uh, the, the reproduction of, of language, uh, whatever the medium, right, raise these questions, even in the way that these PowerPoint slides do allow us to think about them. Um, but it's just maybe a convenient moment where these these questions are rising more forcefully mm -hmm. in the context of science. Questions? I, I have a question for Paula. Um, I enjoy that very much. I think it's really interesting work and very uh, very relevant, especially since um, when I teach engineering, they often use this kind of 
visual sort of, you can visit Rome, you can visit Pompeii, you can go in. So I wondered whether, um, just two things, one, if you had factored in uh, or controlled for age at all in terms of your responses, because one gets a sense that people who grew up with computers have a very different sort of approach to the sort of physical world than those who were sort of older. You had one picture of a young undergraduate and then a sort of older professor. So I wonder if that was a control that you had built into your study. And I was curious about that. I was curious too because, uh, you know, we always talk about digital divide, but uh, um, the only, so there was a difference. Uh, the difference was mainly related to um, the same age though, because the point is this, when professors uh, uh, that sometimes they, I, I also interviewed 60 years old professors um, needed to interact with the design artifacts, they maybe took a little bit more time to understand how the software worked. But the software is pretty easy, and so everybody gets it at the end. So maybe the beginning, you, you would say that for the when they describe the first objects, it takes a little bit longer, and then they realize how it works. So with the second, it will be a little less, and then less, and less. So And that's the only um, real difference I can see there. While, in, uh, surprisingly, what happened with the students students was that students that had to describe uh, the objects just touching them or looking at them or at a picture uh, were distracted. So they told me something, but not really, you know, about shape and function. They were like, two seconds, okay, am I done? Okay, give me credits. <laughs> While, yeah. It's sad, but that's <laughs> how it worked. While students who had to interact with these 3D copies spent so much time just checking and clicking back and forth, color, no color, and then they it seemed like if they were forced to think a little bit further, and they gave me so many explanations and descriptions that I was impressed because I said, I mean, so why? Because I maybe I forced you to focus a little bit more. Also because uh, with the 3D software, it was a, a multi-staged approach because while uh, touching the objects, they had all the objects on a table and they could pick up one and then the second and the third. With the 3D software, uh, software I gave them the first one and they described it and then I stopped the video, changed the object and then again and again. So I don't know why, but they focused more. And so they were able to describe, they, they were less distracted. And this is strange, but that's uh, what happened. So yeah, it's a real interesting point. So I, I don't have a, like I cannot give you a reason. I cannot say why, but that's what happened. This is just observation now. Yeah. And then I guess the second, the other part of it, did you ever put, the, you didn't put these objects within any kind of a context? I just told them where they came from and their age, nothing else, no context at all. Because I started, I, I was at that point, I was really influenced by some readings. I don't know if you know Gibson and his idea of affordances. Mm -hmm. So I was so into these affordances that my point was I want to understand if there is something that happens with when people just interact with these objects without knowing anything about it. If there's an intuition that helped them to understand their function. You know, I wanted to explore this idea of affordances. That's why I decided not to choose context. Yeah. A question for Anastasia. Um, yeah, you're saying that you, the kind of experiences you're trying to describe, you're not interested in their authenticity exactly. Um, I mean, my, with the Benjamin goggles on, I think that whenever there's an issue of like distance and, and you know otherness, that it's, it's you know how can it not be about authenticity? But maybe the more fair way to phrase it would be that there seems to be an element of where repetition and identity are, are in some kind of tension. Where if you have a wilderness trail, you are going the same path that someone has gone to experience what they have experienced. And I assume that for you know a certain class of substance abuser. There's also that, like, you know, your friend told you it was cool, so you're going to swallow it. And that, you know, even with <laughs> Charles Manson and his, you know, 
irreducible gesturing. He is, in some sense, still like performing his Charles Manson-ness before an expectant audience of people who want him to continue being Charles Manson. So I, I was wondering how how this kind of status of repetition might interrupt the kind of absolute you know, alterity that you seem to be describing at certain points in that paper. Um, well, just to sort of clarify, when I bring up the issue of authenticity, the way I sort of understand in the context of my project is that these, I, I sort of look at these experiences myself at a distance um, as texts, as sort of embodied and aesthetic texts, um, and read them in that way. Um, and in that sense, they are, I'm saying that they're read as authentic, but it's not sort of my job to, you know, for instance, if someone claims that having such an experience is revealing X, my job is not to say, well, no, that's actually just the, you know, biochemical interaction that you're having with such and such and therefore it's a it's an illusion or a delusion or so on and so forth so so I see authenticity of, as something that pertains to sort of the content of the event in terms of how it's read um, and in terms of you know repetition I I'm being you know I couldn't really get to it here obviously but um, I, I definitely do not see these experiences in the same in the same sort of way that they're generally um, discussed um, uh, in that you know I don't see them as absolute at all I see them as sort of mediated events um, that are certainly you know uh, uh, um, repetitious and that's sort of part of the work is that by looking at them by distancing them um, in terms of, of seeing them as, as mediated as media objects and as mediated events it sort of allows uh, these questions to come up that are otherwise sort of obscured by this notion that in being sort of ineffable or other that it's therefore untouchable or um, you know outside of critique Thanks. Uh, so I want to go back to Paula's comment on the Bufordan, the idea of Bufordan. So I haven't read much about it, but I think it's really an intriguing idea that applies your project really well. Uh, so what I would like to know, and maybe a comment on it, sort of think about how you feel about this, is uh, in a way the core of your project is about how to rethink the human object interface and interaction when the digital dimension comes into the picture. So basically you have this uh, three-dimensional uh, three uh, digital simulacra, and then the human body interacts with, with that kind of simulacra, right? So in a way, uh, as I was thinking about the idea of affordance and the example of uh, uh, people looking at uh, the Buddhist sculpture, but then imagine that as a as a label that you can actually use to scoop whatever liquid, right? So one thing that I'm thinking about is whether the question is not so much about when the object becomes virtual, how to do how how do we our bodies interact with a virtual object, but rather also the other the other side, which is the body itself. The spectator's body itself is already virtual, right? So in the kind of imaginative interaction with the Buddhist sculpture as a layer, right? So then that body, uh, the body is not, the, I don't know exactly how to come, but basically the spectator is already imagining his or her own body in this virtual space, right? So in other words, uh, it's about the body being the virtual, and then the object is also the virtual. So it's kind of like interaction on a different, on a different level. Yeah, this is uh, very interesting. I, I haven't thought about this, and uh, I think that, that this is something that maybe would need to be explored uh, a little bit further because, and I like the, your idea of simulacra because it reminds me of Baudrillard and uh, this idea of hyperreality that I'm trying to apply because uh, my point is also, uh, I, I think we need to really understand what's authentic and what's the idea and the definition we can give of authenticity and what's not. Um, so I think that this has to do also with the, your comments uh, on uh, virtual reality and how we imagine ourselves as part of that virtual space. And this would be, this goes back to this question because I think that that would be even more interesting if I added um, 
uh, a context and space because in that case people would really become virtual in a sense because they will be part of that virtual space and not just imagine themselves touching the virtual copy so i don't know i don't have a real question but it's a very interesting point yeah that i would need to explore thank you any other questions i mean i have this feeling that we all know that we have three minutes left, so it may be that we have no questions that can be done in three minutes. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for a very stimulating and provocative set of talks that make us think beyond language and some of the problems of representation So that we all address on a regular basis. So thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>